I do like different, it's like they don't show all the stuff, but I do these shows, and it's very like Victorian or something. It's very like carny. You know, you do this little rat and taz, it's all in dance routine, and then you have your books on the side that you can sell as merch. And that's always kind of been my approach. And it's, um, it's a fun approach because not everybody's going to come to the bookstore, you know what I mean? But if you align yourself with other musicians and you have a variety of different ones, I've been on tour now for three weeks and done 14 shows, and some of them have been rock shows, some of them cabarets, some of them bookstores, some of them comic book stores, and it's really great because I don't, I'm not limited to just my one genre or whatever. And then, and that way, you can always cover a variety of different places and genres and different types of people will come to your thing and know about it. And when you had your music store, you met my four. And yeah. I, I forgot about that. I'm glad that you reminded me. Yeah. And I put out this um, seven inch um, where I had auto harps playing backwards and all this trippy, weird kind of, but it's not kind of dark, but trippy stuff. And I love like dark but trippy stuff, like I love Brothers Quay, all these things that influenced me. But another album that I did, another seven inch that I did, was this song, Golden Shoes. I played on the banjo. I put this album out. I recorded it on a tape recorder when I was, um, I think, 19. And then um, we put it out on a, on a seven inch. And then the seven inch went on to it was just randomly everywhere. And then when I moved to New York City, an animator um, named Adam Boba was working at, um, I think you were going to at the time. And so he had access to this like cutting edge animation programming and software stuff at the time. It was in 94, it was like a while ago, 95. And um, so because I made this I just love to think of it like this, like because when I was 19 and I made a weird song on my tape recorder with a banjo and put it out on a 7 inch, I ended up with this animation in New York like three or four years later. Then they got into a, um, it got into a festival around 98 and, the, and Mark Mother got from Devo, they made an award for it because this was like cutting edge award winning kind of like animation at the time. Now it's still it's still cool because you can't tell out when it's from. Because at the time that was really ahead of its, of its curve and now it just looks contemporary. And um, it's called Golden Shoes and it's a song about how um, I was afraid that when you die your body, your soul doesn't go anywhere, it just stays trapped in a pocket. So. And you were also uh, considering, you know, your work as an illustrator. You were doing that from a very young age, right? Did you yeah, know, so? I, I started. Um, I was the cartoonist for my um, high school newspaper. And my comic strip was called Tumor Humor. And it was about when the nuclear power plant blows up and everybody turns into post apocalyptic zombies, but they were all dressed like 50s kind of cute body boxers, but they were like zombies. And um, they, because I'm from like a severely Mormon community where everybody's really conservative, a lot of people hated that, hated me because I was like, making fun of their parents' job at the nuclear power plant. And I was like, drawing really sexy and really horrible stuff. Like, I'll, I'll read like part of it because I, I described to her in here. But I kept winning awards because it was really edgy and it was funny, but it was screwed up. But it was funny and it was well drawn. So, so even though the locals hated me, the, there was like a there was a bigger a bigger voice from a bigger world that was like clearly this is something real and then I got the awards and I got a scholarship to the San Francisco Art Institute and started meat cake when I was like 17 or 18 18 because I was 17 when I was in high school 18 I started meat cake I started self publishing meat cake I like zine style with a photocopier. Um, 
And then I got published by Sam Rowell. In value, actually. yeah, they've been going with the value we saw because they're like rare now, so right. we don't really, but we are going to self publish some more. I've got an idea to do meat cake 2.0 and like some different stories and stuff. Um, just real quick, like, I, I got another movie option and I don't know where that's gonna go, but I've written a screenplay already, so I'm gonna use the screenplay to write a comic book series. For, the, for now, like just to see what happens. And like, I'm gonna self publish that. And then once I self publish enough stuff so it's like big like this again, my publishing company will produce it if it's big like this. But they don't do the little one off things anymore. They just do graphic novels and compilations now. So between zero and this, I have to self publish it. But I'm fine with that. I self publish all the time. But I also get published by regular companies too. I do the combo. And the question was about how many of you are interested in uh, illustrating illustration as a focus at PNCA or doing sort of like comics or graphic novel work? Okay, so this is you know interest cool. definitely here at the school. That's good, guys. Awesome. And I think our illust illustration program is is it headed by Martin French? Also, we have uh, the advantage of Alpha and we're self publishing the final thing about work for the center. Oh, you are? Yeah, we're cool. Yeah, we're doing like things in, and then we, yeah, we're self publishing to get started with the third one. What is the theme? Um, the last time. The last time? Yeah, it's the last time that I did so. Oh. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, that was great. So let's take a look at Golden Shoes. So this is early, early music. Yeah, it's like set to some um, animation from a New York artist. Uh, yeah, and it was funny because he, uh, on his off hours, would make this at the Nickelodeon place. Oh, really? So I'd sneak in up there and go walking around the Nickelodeon when all the lights were out and make this with him. <laughs>
know, it's interesting how like you do something like that, you put it into the world, other people interpret it because that's the purpose of art. And then it comes back at you in a way, and then something else comes out of it later and then another 20 years in the future you're still like people are still seeing it you know that's the that's the point i think that's the point to being an artist the legacy i mean that's why we're worth more after we die <laughs> because it is true sadly but but it is true and but it's because of the legacy <clears throat> you have you have only this small amount of time while you're alive to create everything that's going to be your legacy. And look at it like that, and then you'll always be motivated. <laughs> like, death is nigh, you are mortal. <laughs> yeah. and, and it goes by so fast. Like, I've had my career 30 years, and um, it doesn't seem like that. Like, when I made this, it seems like last week or whatever. But I was a point. Five of them. I'm forty-seven now. It wasn't young. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know what I want to say, but I can't remember what it is now. Um. Oh, oh, I don't know. I want to tell you guys this. I think I told somebody else this, but like I have this because it's like hijacked and hijinks all the time. Like I always play hijinks on everything because I don't like the system. Not to be like. Not really necessary, I don't think myself as an anarchist or something, but because nothing in the system has ever necessarily benefited me, unless I kind of like pretend I'm something I'm not in order to have it benefit me, I don't particularly care for the system. And part of that is like, I don't really like that like all my stuff is going to be worth more when I die. And right now we sell stuff on Etsy all the time and I have a gallerist and presently stuff like that, but at the same time, I think it's really unfair, so uh, I kind of, I'm also a sea captain, like I sail around a lot, and um, I'm in the process of getting like a captain's license, and, um, and a lot of people know that about me, so I kind of think they always say I got lost at sea, and then like post all of my art, you know, like have my intern like post all my art, and then we'll, we'll prepare it all, we'll prepare everything, all the paintings, all the illustrations, all the books, everything we got. And then the university got lost at sea, and we don't know if she's going to come back or not. And but we have all her art available. And then if I want to stay lost at sea, maybe I will. But if I want to come back, I'm like I came back, you know. But we have, we've sold all the art. Like if I was dead, while I'm alive, I can still get the money. So I. Yeah. That's my whole idea. <laughs> I was trying to outthink that system because I thought it was really unfair. Um, <clears throat> no, I was just going to say for the for the kids to know about the diversification of um of the different products that you produce or art items related to your illustrations and comic art to know that by diversifying their their art into different um, areas and applying it. That might be something they might be Yeah, um, that's a good idea. Good. Uh, so, I started as an underground cartoonist in a bunch of really weird performance art style bands. Both of these are niche markets. The good thing about that is you can become famous in your niche and well known in your niche very quickly because it's very small and weird. So that's kind of good. Um, the bad side is that you're delegated to the underground and you're deemed like not as important or weird or whatever. So the kid, it's, it's hard for them to understand how to value you. And so then um, I went from that to doing graphic novels for like mainstream publishing companies. Like I illustrated Jane Eyre um, in like 2006. And then like this book, Hot Witches, came out on Holt. And I made Hot Witches because I was diversifying my market so that teenagers could learn about the occult in a cute way. <laughs> and but also because at the time I was um, teaching inner city school kids, a lot of my kids were Latino or black and what 
and I lived in Hollywood. And what made me realize it was just really sad to me because like here we were in LA, which used to be Mexico, which is their native land, and they are not represented in any of the advertisements or anything ever, anywhere. And and I felt like they were feeling like they were being marginalized, but they were the ones who made up the majority of LA, like ninety percent from my experience living there are Hispanic of some kind. And I just thought that was really wrong and really sad. And so I was like, you know what, I'm gonna make this book where it's like, let's just all celebrate our differences. Let's just just own that you're weird, own that you're different, own whatever your race is, and and um, embrace it and just be cool with it and don't try to conform to the message of the patriarchy and the message of white culture. When, if you're not that, and even if you are, it's, the patriarchy doesn't really serve any of us very well. And I'm not against guys. I'm a true feminist, and like the patriarchy doesn't serve guys either. And we all need to like just retool this because bro the system is broken. It's been broken since we came here, and kill all of the natives to take it over, and then build a broken system. So. It's, it's slowly crumbling around us, and in a way, in a way, that's maybe a good thing because it gives us a chance to build something better and new, and in a way that can actually serve us all and not destroy the ocean. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I did that, and I, because I diversified the market that way, I got this whole other new thing because my um, original fans are now in their twenty, sorry, forties and fifties. And at the time, they were, we were all in our 20s and 30s. Um, so this brought a whole new market of kids, younger kids, into my world and aware of my stuff to, again, go back to my comics. And then, because it teaches in this book how to read tarot decks, I got the idea to draw tarot decks. So I drew this tarot deck, the mermaid tarot deck, and I self-published it. And now I have another weird, well, to me it's weird, but I guess it's more normal. Um, kind of new age, cute. They're cute, they're cute, but way cuter. They're not gothic, they're not punk, and they're not, they don't necessarily know about Suck Dog, or sometimes not even about my comic book. And they just like my tarot deck because it's like cute mermaids, and they're like new age, nice ladies. And I don't know if I'm shocking them all the time with my stuff, other stuff that they do. <laughs> but I see them on Instagram liking it anyway, so maybe they like it anyway. Or maybe they just ex ex accept that I'm also a total freak. Um, but they're really nice. And this blew up, it went viral. And now this, this amongst everything that I do, is the main thing that's kind of our main bread and butter right now, is that we sell the tarot every day. So then, um, and the others themselves too, but it's mainly the tarot. And then, and then, last year, because um, uh, we were still making money off the tarot deck, but I thought, okay, I could could double this if we make another tarot deck, and then we could actually pleasant design the covers of the tarot decks, and we found a really great printer, and. Uh, made it just like a higher level, a higher standard. So then we put out the Queen Alice tarot deck, and the reason I chose chose Alice, and this one's a little more goth style, um, because I think Alice more like a little more gothic and kind of dark and weird, but it's also a kid's story, so it's still cute. And um, I, I love Alice Wonderland. It was one of my ma major influences on my style of illustration, of the way that I write in that dark fantasy genre. So I know the style really well, and I know the uh, story really well. I know how to be the right way to get um, based tarot decks. So I knew how to apply the images and the characters, and it also has a million characters, and it draws 78 cards. So I knew how to apply the scenes of the characters to the meanings of the deck, and then I created the Alice Wonderland tarot deck, and now um, like this one sells on Monday, and this one sells on Tuesday, and this one sells on Wednesday, and this one sells on Thursday. So that way it's like we get double the income, and then when this one runs out, 
we use the money that we got from this one to reprint this one, and then when this one runs out, we get the money to reprint that one. So they kind of tag team each other, and then I didn't, and then I could quit my job working as a ghost host at a haunted house, which was my, you know, day job up until then. <laughs> and um, and you know, I don't usually have a day job. I just, um, but I needed to make some extra income in order to establish credit so that we could buy property, so that we could create the Meet Cape Manor Haunted House Hotel in Savannah, Georgia. And that's why we're in Savannah, Georgia, because we can actually buy that much property there. And um, that's why I moved to Georgia. But it's, it was a five-year plan, and I'm the seventh year of the five-year plan, but I think we're gonna have the house by the end of the year, and then probably open the doors by this time next year. That's kind of our long-term goal. So, I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, you can set a five-year goal for yourself, which I highly recommend you do, and if for some reason it goes over and you don't make it all the way, you know, you don't make it the five-year plan, but you still stay on track and you do finish it, even if it takes seven years, at least you got it done. That's all that really matters. Because when you're 90 or when you're dead, your legacy will still be there, it will still be existing, and nobody will know that it took seven years instead of five. And it won't matter in the scope of your lifetime. Anyways, um, diversification of marketing is super important. And again, you know, my little razzmatazz on my dance routines and all the shenanigans that I do to also sell my stuff. And it's really good to like not expect anything or lock yourself into something because you might have to, you know, be flexible in order to survive. And I've had to retool my business and re redo my whole tactic so many times earlier. Yeah, also, you know, just think globally in terms of your audience. Mm -hmm. Don't allow um, uh, barriers to be set in your mind when you export your, your comic art or your uh, illustration work. Always sort of think of uh, yourself in a, a global, uh, I hate to use the word marketplace, but in a sense, you know, a global marketplace. Because the cards and things that we uh, distribute, we distribute around the world from yeah. China to Tokyo, Japan, everywhere. And uh, there are no barriers. Yeah, and, and my work has always been international. Like, one of the, one of the most amazing moments of my life was uh, in maybe 2003, um, I went to the San Diego Comic Con with my mom and I met these guys from Tokyo called Press Pop who started the like, comics collective there and they care about comics as fine art and they care about weird comics and in general they care about manga in Tokyo anyway. They flew me there twice, I've been to Tokyo maybe four or five times and when I was in Tokyo doing a show, um, a, a guy who's maybe like 20, 22 years old came up to me and he had that same album you have and he wanted me to sign it. I was like, Wow, like again, like I put this out when I was like 19 and here I am in Tokyo in, in the future and he has it. So that's the, to think that way is really important. Like where we live is extremely conservative and everybody's been really, really mean to us since, especially since the Trump regime. They're horrible, horrible people and they hate us and we don't have any friends where we live. But I have friends everywhere else, and I have a market everywhere else, and we make all, uh, money virtually and live very cheaply so that we can live where we live. And if, I didn't, if we didn't have a global market, and an appeal to people, enlightened and different interesting people all over the world, we wouldn't be able to survive where we are. Because they would maybe kill us because we get threatened to be killed all the time in Georgia. Now, it's really, really bad. So, and I'm sure you guys are aware of the shenanigans too. And it's really, really bad in some places. In red states, it's really bad. You guys are blue state, so you're a little better off. But wow, and I'm not from that, like, well I am, I'm from Idaho. So I remember what it is now, but I spent so much time from the time I was 17 until now in like New York City and San Francisco, and I forgot like 
how bad that it was and how bad it could be, and also they've been emboldened now. So it's really, really bad now. Like, we really need to take this seriously. Like, it's becoming like the Nazis are going to roll over everything if we don't do something. Like, it's getting that bad. But the power is through art, though, to create change, and that's the point of the Nikkei Manor in Savannah yeah. as a a place of uh, change and diversity in an environment that's somewhat right. sterile with that. Right, so like if... You can be the change. Right, you can be the change in the world that you want to see, like MLK, and because we're creating an LGBTQ and like diversity, like safe space in a place where a lot of the people are really horrible like that, then we're creating, we're doing more of an impact that if I had stayed somewhere where everybody's liberal and they don't really need that. And, uh, but however, at the same time, there's no way to afford a house in New York or LA. Like, that's just not even an option anyway. You know, because everybody's so much better, that's why these places cost so much more. And I know that you guys are experiencing that because like San Francisco's like a toothpaste tube and the um, money in the tech stuff like, squeezed it and all of the like uh, San Francisco and California traffic and expenses and stuff are coming up here. My brother, my family lived here a long time and they've been telling me like how different it is here and how much more expensive it is and how they can't afford to buy a house here now and all that kind of stuff now too. And it's gonna start becoming like that kind of everywhere and that's one of the reasons why I went to Georgia to buy a house to put an end to this, you know? To put me an end to like living like the grapes of wrath where like you have to constantly move and you're always renting and you don't have full control over your life, you know. So the more you can become completely autonomous and have full control over how your stuff's produced, how your stuff's um um you know, how you uh put it out there in the world how you appear in your as 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 a package like how you advertise yourself the more you have control over all of that the better unless of course you can work with somebody that has a bunch of money and is a higher power that lets you still have a voice and do that and it's, that's a weird balance and sometimes it's difficult like I've come really, really close to getting license, a licensing deal like Shepard Ferry or something and becoming a multimillionaire, and it didn't work, it fell through. Um, but, you know, whenever these types of things, and I've had three movies options by Hollywood for like $10,000 each, I've had all kinds of shenanigans happen with me where I thought this was my big break, and it didn't happen, but at the same, yes, but at the same time, I just think like, okay, that's okay, because it, whatever happens, happens for a reason, and it didn't happen then because it, was, it wouldn't have been the best way for it to happen. So it's just saving itself for the best environment for it to happen. And when it does, it will be the best way. And until then, whatever. As long as I can make a living off of my art, as long as I connect to really cool, like-minded people, which I do every day, you know that's fine i mean that's good enough like if and it's it's actually a really good life and if you can get more that's great that's a bonus but i've got what i want you know really and in the end you know the support of cool people and the support of like your friends like your family and being able to serve like their community and give hope to like other weirdos and artists and women and witches and whoever, LGBTQ or whatever, to give hope to them that we're not just marginalized and silenced, that we can, you know, empower ourselves and make a difference in the world, a difference in the world at least by creating community for ourselves. That's 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 the best we can do anyway, you know. But it's on a smaller level or a big level. Darcy, Kind of take us back to now, like hearing about sort of the evolution of your work in terms of where you're at now and the way that you have sort of diversified um, your output and the range of works. And you have a piece in your autobiography about beginnings 
Oh yeah. I, uh, would you mind reading for us? Oh yeah. Um, so I um, so I have this section um, in my book about how I went to the, I went to the San Francisco Institute on scholarship. And while I was there, I started self-publishing my book, even though it wasn't part of a course and it wasn't part of a class. Excuse me, I was a film major with an animation minor, and um, I intended to make my comic book meat cake into, which is now this book, into a TV series, and I've I or movie, and I've intended to do that a long time, but until you know, you have millions of dollars on the whole thing to work with, at least I can find out like how to do it, how to do movies, and I started self-publishing me cake. So I want to read to you guys about self-publishing me cake so you guys kind of understand the basics like how to start from nothing. And um, you know, I just did it with a photocopier at first. <clears throat> so me cake, inspired by penny dreadfuls and fairy tales, I named my comic Meat Cake because me and cake are the two most decadent things to eat. I wanted to personify a luxurious world so dark and surreal and to such an excess that it is sick. Meat cake is food for the mind. The fact that most movies and TV shows mainly had white straight male lead protagonists repulsed and infuriated me. The only time women showed up was when it was time to objectify them for sex. I was tired of being a minority when women make up more of the population of the world. As a kid, Hippie Longstockings, Alice in Wonderland, and Dorothy from Wizard of Oz were role models for me, the kind of fantasy I also wanted to create. However, all of them were children. This says something about the way women are regarded in patriarchy. Unlike men, who are not as empowered as children, Oh, unlike men who are not as empowered as children, then become more so as adults. Ladies are more free and empowered to be ourselves as children until we become old enough to be sex objects. Then it's time to worry about what everyone thinks of us and freak out about our desirability and get an eating disorder. Finally, liberated of our corsets, the patriarchy merely replaced them by putting corsets on our minds. Time to fend off catcalls and unwanted advances, or not care about our appearance, which affects our personal and professional lives, being the one not hired and considered ugly and unworthy of love. We have to take um, a side in the war over our minds, bodies, lives, and our role in the world. What kind of woman are we going to be? A mother or a whore? A career power bitch? How about none? How about both? I tried to starve myself back into being a little girl again. I shaved off my pubic hair and stopped having my period, but it's still warm. I was 18 and I looked sexy. My legs got long and my butt got big. It was time to take a side. I couldn't hide the little boobies. I wanted my comics characters to represent full-grown ladies who were sexy but still retain the fantasy and freedom of that which Alice, Pippi, and Dorothy all got to enjoy. So I created Me Cake to star all girls and they made out with each other when they felt like it, just like me and my friends. They didn't go on feminist rap like I did in real life outside my work. They just lived gay, surreal, free lives full of magic and possibility. They just were. They represented fragmented parts of my personality made into a whole. Feeling like a freak my whole life, I was obsessed with Victorian freak shows and particularly Siamese twins. Being a Gemini on the cusp of cancer, I always felt Morticia Adams embodied the epitome of female beauty and also what the ultimate cancer lady would look like. The twins, Hendrix and Perfidia, looked like if she was conjoined and exemplified, duplicitous Gemini, but also goth, witchy, and moonlit cancer. Hendrix is a hindrance to Perfidia, whose name means two-faced, also, it sounds like those Victorian names like prudence, temperance, etc. I always thought the twins were Japanese, but again, I didn't say that in the comics. They just were. The way in real life, everyone I know are different races and they just live. Friend the girl is a flapper that looks like the 20s performers Louise Brooks or Josephine Baker. Friend all the girls, she's cute, fun, logical, creative, and wacky, but emotionally stable. In my life, I tend to manifest and gravitate towards people like Friend the Girl, who then end up being friends for life. Her pet is scampy, the selfish shellfish. She was sassy, boiled, and beheaded 
oversized shrimp. Straight ahead, I think, is Latina or Italian. She is beside me that works all the time and had a ton, ton of crappy day jobs as well as being orphaned after her mother, who was a witch, died when the curse was put on her and made her give birth to Strega Pez through her slit throat. Strega, after that, talks through Pez that come from her slit throat, not word bubbles like the rest of the characters. Strega eventually escapes her grueling life of poverty when she becomes a scientist and invents a strong invisible string made from goat's milk and spider webs. Waxwolf is an Edwardian rogue and a cad who is also a werewolf made from wolf hair and wax. He and Richard Dirt play pranks on each other, trying to murder each other through stabbing and poison. He is an undead zombie and never dies, so unfortunately for Richard, this conundrum goes on forever. Mermaid of Fluvia and Richard Dirt both look like me, but the mermaid has long wavy king fantasy hair and Richard is long. Named for the trash that washes up on the beach, Fluvia drinks a lot and doesn't go by what she deems to be landlubber rules. She also has a habit of seducing sailors and stealing all her gold for fun just to throw it back in the ocean because she cares, all she cares about is the ocean. Richard T. Dirt, trouble is her middle name, is a fancy Victorian lady who looked like that, who looked like what was to become later elegant flesh, sweet Lolita, in a pink Victorian dress with blonde hair. As a social experiment, I wanted my pen name to be Richard Dirt just to see how people reacted differently to my book, thinking it was created by a guy, but Kim Thompson, my manager of fan graphics, advised against it. I thought it would be funny to make pre raphaelite paintings into a comic book, also enjoying the illustrations of countless Victorian books of my childhood, emulating the drawings of Aubrey Beardsley and the fashion designer Erte. But when I drew them, because my brain works everything, it would end up looking twisted. Lastly, I'm more into iconic realism, depicting a lot of ladies, but with witchcraft symbolism and surrealist uh, imagery. Some of my favorite young ladies in comics are by Heather Benjamin, Pam Grossman, and Nicole Georges. When I saw Popeye in school in fourth grade, it changed my life. I love the depiction of those 30s cartoon characters in real life, that they lived in a little nautical town that was a world unto itself. Plus, Roger Rabbit is how I picture the Meat Cake movie, but with my design. I really love Mr. McKay. The dreams and the dialogue of the place this little Nemo goes are so inductive of a place that is so touching and nostalgic to me. He used to design circus posters while traveling with them when he was 19. The lovely amazingness that he and Mel Brinkley's gorgeous girly romance used to have a full-color newspaper to showcase entire pages of comic serials astounding by today's standards. Influenced also by the fashion illustrations of Erte, I love Buzzy Berkeley's choreographed dance scenes, Aubrey Beardsley's illustration, and Ed Gorey, who I had the pleasure to meet in my 20s. When I found out all we have of Beardsley was made before he died of consumption at the age of 26, it inspired me to make sure I was part of history before that age as well. To make sure there's some kind of legacy in case I died before 30. I love Tony Millionaire, the man, the myth, and the legend. He draws ships like no other. Also, the Hernandez brothers were a huge influence on me in high school. I love that punk teen girls could be protagonists. I will always think, thank Dan Clouds and Pete Bag for helping me out and inspiring me with their minds. The manga of Sugiro Maruo and the freak show Circus he drew was a major influence when I was developing my style. One of the greatest honors of, in my life was when the fashion company I met in Tokyo represented both of us to do to that design. The art Joe Coleman is the way I think he goes about processing the outcasts and evil in the world. He and his beautiful wife Whitney Moore have been a family, have been like family to me. Linda Berry was an adorable feminist writing style I've always loved, as well as the early works of Julie Say, Trina Robbins, who've also always been an inspiration and source of support through the years. And I also love Neil Rose Garcia, who was so kind to me when I was new to LA after the 911 tragedy in New York City. But really the day my life changed was when I saw a compilation comic with a piece by Sue Ko. She grew up near the slaughterhouse and the comic she did about how factory farms process pigs. Not only this, she alone showed me I could use the comic genre to be an extremely effective way 
to express and exercise deep agony. Also, that it's okay to be female and still be super intellectual and intense. Suko is dolls to the wall. May she live forever. When the velvet was fallow me cake, I also went to movies in Chinatown with my friends in the dark while eating a snack called Cashew Guy Peanut and You. We watched these fantastic movies intently. They starred Chinese ladies who flew through the air, doing backflips off a horse and landing in a tree, their long white ghostly gowns and streaming black hair flying. I wanted to capture the feeling of these movies in Nikkei. I wanted to live in that world combined with my reoccurring dreams of a haunted house that kept astral projecting to when I slept. One that looked like a combination of Jan Spankmeyer's palace and Richard Elfman's Forbidden Zone. The creation of this entire world onto itself that could be very dark, whimsical, and strange, inhabited by multifaceted and often female characters, was very inspiring to me. My grandma had the entire Oz book series from the 19 teens, which I read over and over again as a child, and imitated the illustrations from. I've always felt a little like Ozma. No matter where I live in this landlubber world, and what I must do to survive, I've always had this place in the clouds that I and the readers of BK share, and we will always be there together. Dear reader, you are my family, and I've always relied on the kindness of strangers. They range from everything, from academic laureates to middle-aged punks, dolls, sweet eluded teens, goths, sea captains, adorable cosplayers, mermaids, witches, fairies, fashionistas, feminists, the whole LGBTQ rainbow spectrum, and the classic comic book reader. I love them all, and we are all one and the same.